In this video, we're going to describe a Turing machine that prints its own description. In the previous video, we talked about a couple of different ways of creating a program that prints a copy of itself. In the first approach, the program just accessed the memory containing the instructions as data, and that was sort of the easiest way to do it. And in the second approach, we created a Quine program that uh, didn't use the technique of accessing its, its executable code as data, but instead actually contained as data uh, the characters that represented itself. And now a Turing machine can be represented somehow, and you, you know, in order to represent a Turing machine, you know, we need to have a list of states and uh, the input alphabet and the tape alphabet and the transition function, starting state, accept state, reject state. Uh, we remember all of this stuff. The, the, the representation is of a Turing machine uh, involves all of these things, and of course we can translate these into bits and bytes somehow. Uh, we can linearize a description of a Turing machine and, and store it on a tape. So to create a, so our goal is to create a Turing machine program that ignores whatever's on its tape to start with and executes for a while and then terminates. The, and when it halts, it leaves on its tape a description of the Turing machine itself. So if the Turing machine, for example, has 57 states uh, and, you know, 130 uh, transitions, it would leave on the tape the description of a Turing machine that has 57 states and 130, whatever I said, uh, transitions. So um, we can't use approach one because the Turing machine can't access itself as data. It can access the tape. And initially, when this Turing machine begins running, there's nothing on the tape. So it can't really look at itself. So we're going to have to use approach number two to implement a quine on a Turing machine. And the way we're going to do it is break the problem into two steps. Um, remember in our program uh, that we showed with our little pseudo language, uh, we had a variable called x and we, we set it to some string. And then in the second step, we, we printed it out somehow twice. Okay. Well, um, we're going to do the same exact thing with our Turing machine, only it's going to be a little bit more complicated because we're dealing with Turing machines. So in our first step, what we're going to do is we're going to effectively store a long string somewhere. Okay? And we're not going to say exactly what that string is yet. Okay? But it's a long string of zeros and ones that forms, that, that has some information. And what the first part of the Turing machine is going to do is it's going to write that string onto the tape and then it's going to pass control to the second part of the Turing machine. So our Turing machine will have two phases or two parts. Step A will execute, okay, so we'll have a bunch of step, a bunch of states, and then at some point it'll take a transition to the second phase, and then there'll be a bunch of steps there as well, a bunch of states, and it will execute step B, uh, and then it will terminate. So now what does step B do? Well, the description of this Turing machine has effectively two parts. It has the first part and the second part. And um, the first part is step A, and the second part is step B. So what step B is going to do, it's going to print out step A, and then it's going to print out step B. Okay, it's the description of the Turing machine is going to be broken into two pieces, and so we need to print out the description of the step A followed by the description of step B. And um, so what step B will do, it'll find this, this string, which we don't know what this string is yet, but it'll find this string on the tape when it begins. And so the first thing it does is it prints out the a description of the Turing machine that does the operations in step A. And the second thing it does is it prints out 
a description of step B. And the nice thing is we get to use this variable x in doing both of these tasks. So here's kind of how we're uh, looking at things. Uh, our goal is to leave on the tape a description of step A followed by a step B. Each step is a, a Turing machine in its own right, or we can think of it as a subroutine. And the idea is we execute step A, and then we execute step B. So what we need to write out is the representation of step A and the representation for step B. Before we go any further with this, let's imagine that we have a simple string of ones and zeros. One, zero, one, one, zero, for example. And we can imagine that we could have a Turing machine that would do nothing more than output this string onto the tape. And we can call that Turing machine P and whatever string, we'll, we'll just use that as a subscript. So the string P10110, all that Turing machine does is it writes 10110 on the tape. And in general, P sub W will be a Turing machine that prints out on the tape the string W. Now that Turing machine, P sub W, has a representation, and we'll use angle brackets to indicate the representation of that Turing machine, as we have in the past. So let me ask you this. If I give you a string W, could you build a Turing machine to write out W? Well, yeah, it would be easy. Okay. Let's say uh, there were N characters in W. Um, PW would just be a linear sequence of states with an except at the end. So if our string was 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, we would have states 1, we would have a transition here that writes the 1, transition here that writes the 0, and so on. If our um, string has n characters, our Turing machine would have n plus 1 states, and they'd be organized as, as a simple chain. So creating PW given W is really pretty straightforward. So you could imagine that you could create an algorithm that is passed a string like W and creates the representation of a Turing machine that writes that string. Okay. So in particular, uh, the task of creating this Turing machine, or more precisely, creating a representation of this Turing machine given a string is an easy task. It's clearly computable. Okay? If I give you a string 10110, you could easily produce the description of a Turing machine that writes that string out on the tape. So the task is, is computable, and in fact we can name a function q that does it. So it just ignores its input. Um, and um, I'm sorry, its input is the string w. Okay, so given a string, q is going to take a string such as w and it's going to write onto the tape a description of a Turing machine that would write w. So q is a little bit more complex. It's got to look at the length of w, it's got to figure out how many states, it's got to create names for those states, it's got to create the transition function, and so on. But it's clearly a computable function, and as I said, you can do it if I give you the string 10110 and ask you to create a Turing machine, you could do that, of course, and uh, you could then create a linear representation of that Turing machine using symbols, and you could uh, write it out on uh, a tape. So Q is a function that, given a string, will create a representation of the Turing machine that would write that string if it were run. Our Quine Turing machine has two steps which I'm calling A and B. Let's look at step A first. What step A does is simple. It just writes a long string of symbols on the tape. And we're going to call this string X. This string will turn out to be a description of the step B part of the Turing machine but we don't know what step B is yet, so we can't finish coding step A yet. But we know that it's really easy to do it. We can't 
create the code for step A because we don't know what the string X is yet. But once we know X, we can easily create step A. In fact, well, I suggested we would have this function Q that given a string will uh, create the description of a machine to write out that string. So Q will do the work of creating step A if we want it to. So if, once we know what X is, we can just apply Q, our function Q, and Q will then produce a representation of step A. It will code step A for us. Next, let's look at step B. When step B begins running, after step A is finished, the tape will contain a long string of symbols, which we've called X. So the first thing that step B does is it makes a copy of X. And we know that we can write a Turing machine that will copy one string. And so now the tape looks like this, X and X. We can also shift X around if we need to, if we need more room. So the, the second thing that step B does is it uses this function Q as a subroutine and it applies it to this part of the, of, to the string X. Okay, so it calls Q on X and what does it do? It computes the description of a Turing machine that would write that string. Now if this description is longer, we might want to apply it to this X first and then replace this X with the description of step A and then we can uh, have code that will move, that will swap them. So what we're left with is a description of step A followed by the other string that we didn't touch. So we use Q as a subroutine. We call it, okay, with that tape head positioned here on this X and it changes this X into a description of a Turing machine that would write X. So whatever X is, step B will change the first part of the tape to a description of a Turing machine that would print X on the tape. And now comes the beauty of it all, or the magic I should say. We just let X be a description of step B. And so then, by definition, after we run this, if X is nothing more than a description of step B, then we're left with the tape looking like a description of step A followed by a description of step B. So we're now done coding step B. Okay, we know what the code for step B is. Okay, it's just these things. Make a copy of X, call Q as a subroutine to turn it into a description of, a, of step A and then we're done. Okay, as long as step A printed out a description of step B, these two steps, make a copy and call Q and maybe a few other things to shift things around, um, then we're left with a tape that contains step A in the first part and step B in the second part. So now we're done coding step B. We know a description of step B. It's relatively short and we can now go back and finish up coding step A. Since we know what step B is, we now know what the string X is, so we can go ahead and go back and finish the code for step A. And so that completes our description of how it's possible to create a Turing machine that leaves on the tape a description of that very Turing machine. And so in the next video, We'll talk about the recursion. We'll present the, the recursion theorem and uh, try to explain it and talk about its implications.